There we go. But I think that the one part thing is uh, can I just tell them to think about all this? Project? Go, go right ahead. I'm good. Thank you. Carlos, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, would you mind just going through there? There's some virtual participants, and I want to like put them. Okay. Sorry, thank you. There is that okay? I don't know. Yeah, do oh, there you go. Oh, there's Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Um, so uh so a lot of people are asking about Altos. So I, I just I'm gonna give you a five minute summary. So uh, Altos, we're we're a company, so we're we're not we're not a non for nonprofit. So we do want to sell something at some point, uh, but we're studying aging, and so the the people that are investing um, realize that there's a. Uh, yeah, there beyond the power of the last years, uh, there's lots more. I don't know how to do this. Oh, somebody else has to meet. Okay, cool. So um, so they asked, so they realized that there's a lot of questions in biology that are not answered by you know an an, an NIH grant or an NSF grant because there's there's a lot of fundamental things. Sorry, Matt, no offense. So <laughs> so um, so they started this 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 thing with the goal of kind of studying the basic science along the lines of a problem. And the problem is essentially how why do we age? How do we age? Why does aging happen? Uh, but when you ask those questions, you know. Uh, it's very easy to say, you know, you see a, a, an older person and you can tell they're older or a baby and you can tell it's a baby. But what happens at the molecular level? Do proteins age? Do, do this DNA age? Where does aging happen? Uh, and, and why is it that, you know, for example, cancer and heart disease are, are diseases of aging, but others are not, right? So, so we have a very strong, so we have some of the best people in the world in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this field, people that study cellular programming like Shinya Yamanaka and Wolf Reich and people like that. We also have some of the best people in the world in, in uh, studying integrated stress responses. Why do cells respond one way and not another when they're young versus old? If you cut yourself, when you, a baby, my kids are five year old, he heals within a week. My their grandma, my mother, it takes her, you know, a couple of weeks. You know, what what is it about a system? And so for me, uh, as a modeler, we're asking fundamental questions like, well, how do we define a cell state? What does it mean to be resilient? Resilient with respect to what? Uh, if we believe that networks of cellular processes are what drive uh, uh, systems, can we understand that? Can we understand these processes? And so, so we have a lot of space for a lot of different uh, expertise to come and, and, and uh, contribute. So if this is exciting for you guys, you know, drop me an email or connect on LinkedIn or whatever your favorite thing is. And let me know. Uh, we are, we're looking for really talented people that are excited about leaving the box, you know, and, and leaving your comfort zone and learning new things. So, you know, yes, go ahead. Uh, Actually, we're in Redwood City. So we have three sites. We have uh, Redwood uh, City, which is the Bay Area Institute. We have the San Diego Institute. We have the Cambridge Institute in the UK. And then we are going to, we have, we will be opening a Kyoto kind of institute in the, I think in the fall. Uh, right now, we're not doing remote work because collaboration requires being present because, I mean, I can give you a data dump over Zoom, but the collaboration happens when we're walking in the hallway. And, you know, unfortunately, that's the way we work as humans. So, yes, go ahead. Mm. Uh, absolutely, yes. And there's there's actually a lot of people working on single cell data. And uh, uh, so everything from modeling to experiments. So there's some people that are doing mouse models. There's some people that are doing single cell, their cell population. Um, there's many different tissues. I mean, we're a pretty big lab. Uh, so, and the idea is that, you know, the basic research drives, you know, the, the eventual, you know, um, uh, business side. Say it again? 
So we don't have internships yet. They will start in the fall. But if you if you have no anyone that's interested, please just contact me, drop me an email or whatever. And uh, it all starts with NSF. So, you know, definitely apply for those grants because it's, you know, it's why I'm here. So, <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. All right, anything else? All right, I'll, uh, so I'll introduce you to some, since I'm the MC, I'll introduce you to Leonard. He's awesome. He used to come to the lab and I'm a professor at Arkansas. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about, you know, he's gonna be let me put this in presenter mode. <clears throat> All right, yes. So as Carlos mentioned, um, I am a assistant professor in biomedical engineering at the University of Arkansas. I worked with Carlos for many years and also Vitor Coranta in the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt. So uh, my background, my, my PhD is in chemical engineering. So I have a, an engineering uh, education that I worked for many years in the School of Medicine, building computational models and using you know, my engineering instincts to study biological systems, get close to the, to the data. And now I'm back in, in, uh, in BME. Uh, so I've, this is kind of the reason why we're here. Um, I have a lot of experience Working with experimentalists, I can tell you it's not easy. So uh, that's why these kind of um, uh, you know, workshops, tutorials, I think are really useful. So this is modeling for cell biologists. So I'm assuming you all are basically wet lab people. Do any of you have some modeling experience or at least computational experience? Some, okay, uh, like data analysis stuff or ODEs, Any, anybody do ODE modeling? Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm a mechanistic modeler, which is like differential equations, ODEs, if you don't know what that means, ordinary differential equations. Um, and so that's gonna be my primary focus. I'm gonna touch a little bit on data analysis stuff, machine learning or whatever, which I know is kind of hot. Uh, that's not my specialty. And I'm gonna try to really draw the distinction between these two types of approaches because this stuff comes up all the time. Uh, and I'm constantly uh, in conversations about the difference between these types of modeling approaches. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna do, by the way, is I'm just gonna go through, this is just a very broad overview, okay? Uh, I'll give you, I'll go through an example from my own work and then we're gonna do a little um, kind of team hands-on kind of thing. It's very simple. Uh, hopefully you all will be able to run something on your computer. If you can't, no big deal. Uh, I'll show it to you on my computer. We'll see how it goes, okay? Okay, so um, the first question, right, uh, in your mind might be, why are we even modeling? What's the point of building a model, right? So this is a quote from, John von Neumann, right, one of uh, history's greatest geniuses. And this is what he said about modeling. He said that sciences do not try to explain, they hardly even try to interpret, they mainly make models. By a model is meant a mathematical construct with the addition of certain verbal interpretations describes observed phenomena. The justification of a mathematical construct is solely and precisely that expected to work. So what he's basically saying is science is modeling, right? Uh, when we try to understand how, how a system works, we often build a mental model of what's happening. And then if that model is able to make predictions about uh, you know, how the, the nature works, well, then the model is telling us something, right? It might be right, it might not be right, we may be missing things, but nevertheless, everything we do in science is a model. Now, of course, he's a mathematician, so he wants to take this further and go beyond just mental models, pictures, whatever, right, and actually formalize it into mathematics. And that's what I do. That's what we try to do in uh, quantitative systems biology. Some of you may also have heard uh, this quote. This is common in our area. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. So this was uh, said by George Box. Uh, this is, I don't think he said it in 2005. I think it was just repeated in 2005. But in any case, uh, if you haven't heard this, if you keep working in this field, you will hear it because everybody says it. And I just want to emphasize, okay, 
most people, many people focus on the first part, all models are wrong, okay? But they always leave out the second part, but some models are useful. So just because your model is wrong, it's always gonna be wrong because you can never capture everything in precise detail. That doesn't mean you can't gain insights into biological systems, you can't make predictions, et cetera, right? So always keep that in mind. To me, that's a super important point. And I'm going to try to emphasize this point with a maybe a little bit of a silly example that I often use when I present this stuff. But put, put biology to the side for a minute and just remember back to your high school physics, astronomer, you know, classes, science classes. So uh, way back, you know, hundreds of years ago, there was this guy named Copernicus who had this crazy idea that maybe the earth wasn't at the center of the universe, right? Maybe the sun was at the center of the universe. And at the time they just thought the solar system was the universe and everything moved around it in, uh, all the planets moved around the sun in concentric circles, right? This is a model of the universe. Uh, Galileo came along about 100 years later, revisited this idea, got thrown in jail for his heresy. But um, Kepler, who was his contemporary in Germany, um, came along and revisited this idea and said, you know what, Copernicus was wrong. But his model of the universe was wrong, but it was useful, right? The, the sun is at the center in a sense, but the planets don't move around it in concentric circles. They move around the sun in, term, in ellipses, right? Okay, so this is a different model of the universe. Now, this is not a, we could call this, hold on. Start going. Okay. This is a phenomenological model. Sorry, the toolbar is in the way. Actually, that helps. Okay, this is a phenomenological model of the universe, right, or of the solar system. This is not based on any understanding of why the planets are doing what they're doing, but it is an accurate description of what is happening, and it's predictive. You can use, you can make observations, and you can predict where the planets will be in the future based on knowledge that you have right now, okay? So it's a predictive model, but it's not, but it's phenomenological. Um, Excuse me, are the slides supposed to be changing? Because I'm still seeing the same first slide online. They should be changing, yes. I don't know if anyone else is having that problem. Anyone else online? What slide do you see? I see the first slide with your title and your name. Oh, uh, let me switch it to the slideshow. Maybe that will fix it. Is that better? That's it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I just had it in presenter mode, so. Okay. All right, so I promise this will all connect to biology, all right? So another hundred years goes by and along comes this guy, Newton, right? And he uh, develops this theory of gravity, which says that, you know, forces between two masses are proportional to the inverse of the, the square of the difference between them, right? And with this uh, model, of gravity, he can not only predict, oh, this thing's not good. Okay. He can not only predict where the planets are going, but he can explain why the planets are moving with the way that they are. Okay. So Newton's model of gravity is a mechanistic model of celestial dynamics, as opposed to Kepler's phenomenological model of molecular of, of celestial dynamics. Now, both are important, right? The, the phenomenological model comes first. Uh, who knows if Newton would have gotten as far as he did if he didn't have this to build on top of. So I also wanna make that very clear that it's not a competition, right? All of these things are important. One builds on top of the other. At the same time, I don't think anyone would argue that Newton's mechanistic understanding of how the planets move is not many times more valuable than Kepler's uh, are useful, let's say, than Kepler's um, understanding of celestial mechanics. And then of course, along comes Einstein, and once again says, Newton's model is wrong, right? But of course, Newton's model is useful. So again, 
really want to emphasize this point that your models will always be wrong. They have always been wrong throughout history, not just in biology and in, in physics, uh, but we make progress nonetheless. So don't let this idea that your model is always missing something, that you don't have everything, all the biological realism in your model prevent you from going forward with it, drawing insights from it, so on. Okay, so very broadly, I would say that uh, Copernicus and, and Kepler's phenomenological models are analogous to like bioinformatics techniques. I should probably put up here like machine learning, statistical models, okay? So these are models of the universe based on data, based on observations. Whereas Newton and Einstein are more like theoretical biological models. They understand the inner workings of the system, right? And these two things together constitute at least my definition of what systems biology is. So systems biology is a co collect combination of experimental data together, especially particularly large scale experimental data uh, with advanced computational techniques to pull out inferences and build statistical models, but that has to be supplemented with a mechanistic understanding of what's actually driving these behaviors if we want to do things, for example, like identify novel drug targets for cancer, which is the area uh, that I work in. Okay. Any questions about that? I thought so. Okay. Okay. So that's just my my real basic background of like, what is system biology? What is the difference between mechanism, mechanistic models and phenomenological models? When you work in a real biological system, uh, you're gonna have to choose a modeling method. So I'm just gonna very briefly go over a few things here. But what the first thing that is really important to recognize, right, is that biological systems are highly multi-scale, spanning all the way from the genetic level to proteins, organelles, cells, tissues, up to the whole body. And the methods that you use, the methods that are applicable at each of these different scales are going to often be different modeling methods, modeling paradigms. And so if you're studying one particular aspect, you might choose one method. If you're studying a, a phenomena that spans scales, you may have to somehow link these together in a multi-scale modeling effort, which is difficult. And there's lots of work out there uh, and even some platforms for doing that sort of thing okay and so this is just this is not the greatest image to look at but this is just uh, to show that uh, if we look in terms of time scale and length scale okay at the smallest length scales where you have the fastest uh, processes you have like quantum mechanics right so way down there if you're studying single atoms, molecule, or even proteins, you may have to, to use like quantum level molecular mechanics or molecular dynamics type techniques. As you move up into the atomic scale, there's molecular mechanics, molecular dynamics, partial differential equations, uh, so on and so forth. As you get further up, there's ordinary differential equations and reaction diffusion equations. That's what RDEs are. Then when you get up into the cellular level, you can also use uh, ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, as well as things like agent-based models, which some of you may have heard of. And then finally, we get all the way up to the level of the tissue. There's partial differential equations, uh, cellular automata, which is CA, and so forth. So again, you've got to know uh, the scale that you're operating at, and then um, get some idea of what is the appropriate modeling method for that uh, scale that you are interested in. Okay, and here is a non-comprehensive kind of list of different modeling methods and software that's out there, okay? So as I mentioned, you know, my specialty is mechanistic modeling, so this is what I know best. Uh, at the lowest scales, you've got molecular dynamics or Brownian dynamics techniques. These are studying individual molecules, proteins. Um, then as you move up to the, to the level of uh, interaction reaction networks, biochemical networks, uh, if you are interested in, or if your process involves a lot of stochastic fluctuations, you may need to use a stochastic simulation method like the stochastic simulation algorithm or something called the master equation. 
further up the scale, you've got ordinary and partial differential equations, agent-based models, and also something called logical models, a specific type of which is known as a Boolean model. There are also data-driven models. So this is not my area of expertise, although I'm bringing in more machine learning AI stuff into my work uh, and integrating it with mechanistic models. I think that's a very important uh, direction uh, to go in, but so, you know, multivariate regression, machine learning, AI, and there's a bunch of software tools out there. So Charm is a well-known um, uh, tool for doing molecular dynamics on biological systems. Stokekit, SS are tools for stochastic simulators. Coposse, virtual cell, Tellurium, these are very big, very old, uh, long-standing uh, tools for building uh, and running differential equation and stochastic simulation-based models. Uh, what Carlos and I focus or uh, uh, specialize in are tools known as PiSB, which is a Python tool for systems biology, and another tool called BionetGen, biological network generator, which uh, PiSB uses. So this is uh, something called rule-based modeling, which is what my training is in. There's also tools PhysiCell and NetLogo, which are agent-based modeling tools. Boolean Net and GinSim are Boolean uh, simulators. And then you've got SPSS TensorFlow, which are uh, machine learning uh, packages. And there's all sorts of uh, free packages in R and Python to pull from, okay? So um, the important point here is that some of these methods and tools are easier to use than others, right? And especially if uh, you all are wet lab biologists and you have no idea what any of this stuff is, it's gonna feel overwhelming, right? This is why you're here. This is why you need a collaborator. You need somebody like Carlos and I or the other modelers here who have experience with these sorts of things or know people who have experience with different tools. Like, you know, I'm not an expert in agent-based models, but I know people who are, right? Uh, so, so that's also very important. Some of these things you can use yourself, some you may need help with. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's keep going. All right, here is another, this is a question I get asked all the time. And maybe you've asked this question as well. How much data do you need to build a model? Okay, now my answer, which sometimes is not well received, uh, is we can build a model with whatever data you have, okay? Now, I wanna, I, I put this here for a reason, because I really, I need to emphasize that this is true for mechanistic models. This is different from data-driven models. Data-driven models, right, require data. It's in the name of them. So you've gotta have lots of data, so that you can get like statistical confidence in your correlations and things like that, right? That's, that's what data-driven modeling is. Mechanistic models are theory-based. So they fill the gap of what you don't have in the data, right? So we can, I, I'm gonna show an example, but I'm gonna emphasize this point that when you're working with a mechanistic modeler, uh, what they're gonna do is try to use theory and basic understanding of biochemistry to, to propose something that you don't know, and then test it, hopefully experimentally, to see if you're on the right track. And if, that the, and if it's off, you update the model, and then you just repeat in an iterative process, okay? So here is my super oversimplified example, but hopefully this gets across the basic point. So let's just imagine this one extreme case where we've literally got one data point, right? Just one concentration of something at a point in time. Now this happens all the time. Like this is like a Western blot, right? Or a qPCR or something. Where I've got one data point for one gene at some point in time. Okay. So can I build a model from that? Sure. I mean, and I guess technically I've got two data points if I assume the thing starts at zero at time zero. I could build a model for that, right? No big deal. But the problem is I can build many models that all explain that one data point. So again, building models is actually very easy. If you came to me and said, I wanna model this system, how do I do it? I said, I don't know. Tell me the interactions you think are going on and I'll stick it in the code and we'll make something work. But 
how do we know whether that model relates to reality at all, right? That's the part that's difficult and that's where we need the data. So there are uh, sophisticated formal techniques known as model selection techniques that given an available uh, set of the data set, you can build multiple candidate models uh, that explain that data and then they'll, they'll get scored where it basically will choose the, the simplest model that uh, fits the data the best, okay? And so it tries to put some quantitative value uh, on this. But now say we collect a second data point. So now that we've got some candidate models, we can ask the question, can these candidate models predict that new data point? So model one cannot, right? Model two can, but model three cannot. So just based on that, we can immediately eliminate models one and three, say those ones can't be right. So model two is our best bet right now, right? But that doesn't mean that's the correct model because we know that all models are wrong. Our hope is just that this model is useful. And maybe at this point, we bring in some other candidate models that can also explain these two data points and we keep uh, doing this process and collecting more data. So model building is an iterative process of describing what you know now, making predictions, and then updating your model and your, your candidates, your hypotheses, as you collect more and more data. This is super important. This has to be an iterative process from modeler to from model to experiment and back. So I bring this up too because try, for, try not, I'll, I'll, let me, I'll speak for the modeling community. Try not to think of a modeler as like, you know, a contractor that you're just going to give some data to and they're just gonna return something back to you. At least with this type of modeling, where we're trying to really understand mechanism, that doesn't work. It's gotta be an integrative process of where we're talking to each other. You're telling me what you think you know about the system. I'm sticking it into the computer and seeing if in fact, what you think you know is producing what we expect. And we go back and forth like that, okay? And so it's really useful, especially on the modeling side to include the modelers in discussions of like experimental design, what things are you gonna measure, try to see if there are certain measurements that will help inform the model the best, et cetera. Those are hard questions to answer, but um, you can come up with, with ideas. And as you grow that, that relationship, it gets easier and easier. Just, just to Okay. So that's going to lead me to what I call the six easy steps for building a mechanistic model. Okay. And so here we go. <laughs> right. It's half the 12 steps. It's even easier than the 12 steps. Uh, okay. Step number one, list out everything that you know. So that can come from the literature, that can come from your own experiments, that can come from just domain expertise, whatever, right? But you've got to list out in some way everything you know or think you know about a system. Step number two is to then draw a diagram based on that list, okay? So hopefully you see that these two steps anybody can do, right? You don't have to have any experience in modeling to do this. List everything you know, draw a diagram. The third step is then to formalize that diagram mathematically. And this is where you need an expert, right? Or you need to get trained yourself. But this is, this is the difficult part, turning this diagram into a mathematical code, right? Uh, an, an algorithm to produce some type of, of results. And I'll show that, how we do that in a minute. But once you have this, this model now implemented in a piece of software, you then can basically use that as any other experimental system. 
instead of cells in a dish, right? Or instead of a mouse model, you just have a computer model. And you, do, you have to know how to interrogate that model, how to add things to it, inhibit things, overexpress things, whatever, in that, in that mathematical model and investigate what that model is capable of doing in silico. So by the way, this has nothing to do with data. Once you have a mathematical object, you should interrogate it and see what kinds of behaviors it's capable of producing. Because as you do this more and more, you'll realize that these things are highly nonlinear and very complex and often will give you uh, behaviors that you don't expect. We call those emergent behaviors. Once you've gone through that and you've spent some time kind of getting to know your model, uh, you then want to compare your model behaviors to experimental data. So this is where that fitting comes in. So this includes estimating parameters, uh, which is a big, big issue. And you know, we have, Carlos and I have worked in this area for a long time. There's many sophisticated algorithms for doing this, uh, for collecting ensembles of parameter sets and et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of, of, of specialty stuff, specialty stuff, which again, as wet biologists, you don't need to know, but you have to have somebody to work with who knows how to do that. And you, at this point, then you, you, you estimate your parameters from experimental data, and then you make the predictions that I said can be then tested experimentally. And then you just rinse it and repeat, and you just go, and this is just, again, a process. You, and then people often ask me, how, when do you stop? You stop when you have enough to write a paper mm -hmm. or a grant, right? Or you get bored and you wanna look at something else, that's all. I mean. All models are wrong, so it's never ending technically, right? You stop when you feel like stopping. That's all there is to it. Or maybe a better answer is you stop until you can answer the question that you, you're looking to answer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Please repeat the questions. Yeah, okay, sorry. So the, the question is, which of these steps is the hardest? I mean, so I would say that, I actually have it here, right? This is, this is the hardest, uh, formalizing the diagram mathematically. This takes, th this is not a straightforward process um, and it often takes some uh, experience, you know, just like with anything. I mean, I can't go and collect experimental data without, training and years of experience so yes yeah i mean so the 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 idea is you have a biological question you're asking and but you may there may be many different models that can answer that question Right, but some models might be very complicated and some models might be more simple. It's, and so it's like Occam's razor, you know, with all things being equal, use the simplest model that can answer the question that you're, that, uh, that you're asking. But that, again, that doesn't mean that model's right. It just means that given the data you have now, that's the best one, but you collect more data, a model that scored worse on the smaller data set may actually turn out to be the better model in the long run. So it's, it's not black and white that way, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go through an example then for my own work, I'm gonna show you all, uh, well, the first three of these steps basically. Okay, uh, don't wanna keep you all too long. Okay, so this is uh, something I've been working on with collaborators in the Vanderbilt Center for Bone Biology for a couple of years now. Um, this is uh, a model of tumor-induced bone disease. So if you've never heard of tumor-induced bone disease, very basically, when tumors press up or they metastasize to the bone, they press up against the bone, the, the mechanical stiffness of the bone causes them to secrete factors. In particular, this hormone or hormone-related protein, parathyroid hormone-related protein, PTHRP. Uh, this drives expression. Do I have it here? Yeah. This. Uh, let me let me go down. Here. Okay. So what happens is 
when tumor cells press against the bone, they secrete certain factors. In particular, this protein, PTHRP. PTHRP activates expression of rank ligand on the surface of osteoblasts, which are the cells that build bone, right? And that rank ligand then activates the osteoclasts, which are the cells that consume bone. So basically what happens, right, is that your normal bone is you have a, a balance of osteoblast building bone and osteoclast consuming bone, and then you get an equilibrium density. Well, the tumor knocks that all out of balance. So you get more osteoclast, less osteoblast, and the, the bones become thin and weak, and people have joint pain, and they get breaks and things like that. So it's a really terrible uh, condition, and it's, you know, common across all cancer types, because all many cancer types, uh, or many cancer types at least, they metastasize to the bone. So there are uh, drugs that can reduce the bone destruction, but they, they don't have any drugs that can both reduce bone destruction and kill the tumor at the same time. So there is a great need for new treatments in this area. And this is called, oh, I should mention, should have mentioned that the osteoblasts, as they consume the bone, they release TGF beta. And TGF beta drives expression of this gene that my collaborators are particularly focused on called GLE2, which is what drives expression of PTHRP. So as more bone is consumed, there's more signal driving more PTHRP, driving more bone destruction. So it's a vicious cycle and it gets worse and worse and worse over time, right? So people have, and for, for decades, they've studied this. They have this kind of very basic visual understanding of it. They've got you know, what they think. Uh, they think they understand how it works. And based on this vicious cycle model of tumor-induced bone disease, they've developed a number of different drug treatments that have all failed. And, we don't, and nobody knows why, right? Basically, that's the, that, that's the basis of this project. So here's some... Uh, experimental data from their papers. I'll, this, it's, there's not much here, but I'll go through it just bit by bit so you can all see it. Um, so this is just mRNA expression as a function of substrate stiffness, okay? And they look, they look particularly at three genes, PTHRP, this is GLE2, which I mentioned before, and this is an integrin, integrin beta-3, which exists on the surface of these cells. And what they see, right, is that as they grow these cells, these are different cell lines. So they show it's, it, it works over multiple cell lines. When they grow these cells on stiffer substrates, they see an increased expression of all three of these genes. So that's some evidence that there might be some connection between them, right? It might, doesn't have to be causative, but it might be. Uh, then they also did these FRET experiments where, uh, if you don't know what FRET is, it just basically, gives you a signal if two, pro, if two uh, surface receptors are close to each other. So, well, you all probably know better than I do. Um, but anyway, so they looked at this. Uh, they grew these cells on uh, hard substrates and soft substrates. And what they saw was that integrin beta-3 and TGF beta receptor type 2 co-localize on hard surfaces, and they don't on soft surfaces. So just based on this, we know that on hard surfaces, TGF beta receptor and integrin beta 3 co localize, and that there is increased expression of PTHRP, GLE2, and integrin beta 3. So here's so now, so step one is what do we know or what do we think we know, right? So I'm gonna, there's, I, I trimmed this down a little bit, but I'm gonna just, I'll go through this step by step. So PTR. PTHRP is expressed in patients with bone metastasis. GLE2 is expressed in bone and increased with rigidity. GLE2 regulates PTHRP in a hedgehog independent manner. Some of this is based on the, the slide I just showed you. Some is just based on their research over the years, okay? GLE2 knockout mice have reduced tumor burden and bone destruction. TGF beta regulates GLE2, but is not bone specific. As rigidity increases, TGF beta receptor two and integrin beta three co-localize. They do not co-localize on soft substrates. This stimulates mechanical signaling through FAC, ROC, and others that results in increased GLE2. TGF beta inhibition using a drug called 1D11 
reduces GLEE2 expression in vitro, but does not reduce tumor burden in vivo once tumors are established. GLEE2 inhibition using another drug called GANT58 reduces bone destruction, but does not eliminate tumors in vivo. And integrin beta-3 inhibition blocks mechanical responses of tumor cells and prevents bone destruction, but not tumor growth. Okay, so this is literally the list of things they sent me, right, in an email. And I had to, based off of this, together with them and my uh, postdoc mentor at the time, we built a diagram off of that. So that's step two that I mentioned, right? So here's the diagram that we put together. And so very briefly, okay, this is TGF beta receptor two. This is the integrin beta three, alpha V beta three integrin. This just represents binding and unbinding of the integrin to the receptor. TGF beta ligand can reversibly bind to the receptor on the extracellular side. Then SMAD can bind to the intracellular side of TGF beta receptor two and get phosphorylated. And phosphorylated SMAD acts as one of the transcription factors for the GLE2 gene in the nucleus. Then over here, they know that this integrin activates this protein rho A and active rho A then activates another protein ROC in a cascade. Active ROC helps to phosphorylate MEK and phosphorylated MEK leads to phosphorylation of P38-MAPK. And phosphorylated P38-MAPK together with SMAD, with phosphorylated SMAD act as co-transcription factors to GLE2. So this is supposed to be mRNA and then that produces GLE2 protein. And then we know that they know, or at least again, they think they know. GLE2 protein drives expression of integrin beta 3 and PTHRP. PTHRP is what eventually gets secreted from the cell. And then all sorts of other downstream things. And so importantly, right, integrin beta 3 comes back up here, it gets transcribed and comes back to uh, the membrane. So Overall, what we have here, right, is there are two branches of signal coming from the membrane that are converging down here on this protein GLE2. And then GLE2, by driving expression of the integrin, is, is creating a feedback loop where the more GLE2 you get, the more integrin you get, and the more integrin you get, the more GLE2 you get, right? So this is a positive feedback loop. And so for those of us who've worked in this field for a long time, we see these things and we say, okay, uh, this model's going to do some interesting stuff because it's got some kind of weird nonlinear dynamics in that. That is often not easy to predict. Okay. And then I mentioned these drugs, right? 1D11, which is a TGF beta inhibitor, GANT58, which is a GLE2 inhibitor. And then we mentioned that this co-localization occurs on hard surfaces, but not on soft surfaces. So I can model a hard surface by increasing the binding constant of the integrin to the receptor. I can uh, model the action of the drugs of 1D11 and GANT58 by having them bind reversibly to their targets and basically sequester them from being able to participate in whatever uh, reactions go on downstream. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. So now I'm just going to, there's not a ton here and I don't really worry about the math, but I'm gonna go very briefly through how we then, you know, this is the formalizing of this diagram into a mathematical model. Again, this is where you'll need some help if you haven't done this before. But in this model, we've got relatively simple processes. So there's, the first one is reversible binding, for example, TGF beta to the receptor, right? We also have binding of the integrin to the receptor, uh, SMAD to the intracellular side, and then we're modeling the action of the drugs as reversible binding events. So this is just a basic biochemical reaction, modeling binding of two things, A and B, with some forward rate constant and some reverse rate constant, which we don't know what they are, right? We're going to have to infer that from some data or get some measurements. And so then we can say, all right, the forward rate constant, we're going to use what's known as mass action kinetics, uh, which is the kind of thing you learn in like 
uh, chemical kinetics class, say, in the chemical engineering curriculum. And we say that the forward rate of this reaction is some constant Kf times the concentration of the protein A times the concentration of the protein B. And then the reverse rate is just some reverse rate constant R times the concentration of that complex. And then we can define a dissociation constant as the ratio of the reverse to the forward constant. Okay, so that's it, that's easy. In our software, we just write this, basically. We can put this into the software and all of this stuff happens on its own, just gets calculated automatically. Then we have this catalytic activation phosphorylation cascade. So these are also very simple rules. We just say that some protein A in the presence of some catalyst X will become activated at some rate. And then we have a deactivation, a spontaneous deactivation rate so that it can achieve some kind of an equilibrium. And then we have the same type of formalism, mass action kinetics to model that. So in our model, in the software, we can just enter these two reactions. Uh, and then I mentioned that uh, we're saying that when this is co-localized, we are assuming that this activation of row A is increased. So we can change the rate constant depending on uh, of this event, depending on whether that's bound or unbound. And then for the last one, we have gene expression, which is a little more complex to model, but we've got GLE2 driving expression of the integrin, also of PTHRP, and we can model gene expression. This is a simplified model gene expression, but a kind of a common one. So we can say that if you have N transcription factors T, they form some oligomer in one step Tn. So if you if it's a dimer, but if it's like a nine-mer or something, right? We say you have nine monomers that forms a nine-mer. Now that's a big assumption. We're making assumptions that it's like cooperative binding. Once one thing binds, it boom, 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 boom. They all bind quickly after that. If that's not the case, or if you don't think that's the case, you can add individual steps in there. But this is a very common thing to do to make this assumption. Then you assume that this oligomer can bind reversibly to your promoter site of your gene, G. And then if the transcription factor is activating, uh, we say that this bound gene then produces mRNA. And so the bound gene acts as a, as a catalyst, as an enzyme to produce mRNA, okay? And then we can do some fancy math. We can assume that these processes happen really rapidly. And so that lets us do some algebra, which reduces the equation for the rate of production of mRNA to some factor like this, which is known as a Hill equation. And some of you may have seen this before. I mean, Hill equations are relatively common. If you've ever played around with a model, even if you didn't know where it came from, you'll often see terms like this stuck into the equations. They're not always explained where they come from. So now you know, they come from something like this. And we can get even fancier. So we've got two transcription factors binding to the gene. And so if that happens, we just have to take them both into account. We, get a, we can derive a modified version of this equation. Okay. So like I said, this is the hardest part. This is where you need an expert who's done this for a long time, knows how to do the algebra, knows how to set up the equations, and knows how to plug stuff into your software. But once you have that, once that's implemented, now we can begin to play with it. So I'm going to show you a couple of in silico experiments as animations to hopefully get across this, this point. So um, as I mentioned before, right, row A gets activated off of the integrin. And let's start with a situation where the binding rate for the integrin to the receptor is very low. So the, the magnitude of the rate is represented by the thickness of the arrow there, okay? So it basically doesn't bind or binds very weakly to the receptor. In that case, most of the activation of row A is gonna come off of the unbound integrin. That then would they'll, they'll send two signals to Glee2, which let's, you know, you would hope or we wonder if it will be enough to activate Glee2. Okay, so if I do that and I run it, nothing happens. The Glee2 level stays at zero. Uh, now, of course, I have to choose parameters and so forth. Don't worry where they came from for now. 
remember, I'm just playing around with the model to see what it's capable of doing. So with the parameters I chose, if I don't, if I make the binding very weak, there's not enough signal coming in to turn GLEE2 on. But now I add a mechanical force, which I model by increasing the binding rate to the receptor. And when I do that, now the activation comes off of the bound integrin, which sends a stronger signal to the gene. We get this stronger feedback and it turns GLEE2 on. And it reaches this steady state, in this case, somewhere around 1100 molecules. Okay. So I took this to my collaborator. He said, okay, that's kind of neat. Uh, what happens now if you remove the force? So my first instinct was, well, if I, you know, I needed to add the force to get GLEE2 to turn on. If I remove the force, everything should just go back down to zero, right? But sometimes it doesn't work out as you expect. So when I do this, the GLEE2 level came down, but it didn't go all the way to zero. It stayed elevated. And this was certainly not expected by me. And it took me a little time to think about it. What's going on here is this is like the spark plug in your car, right? You need a spark to get your engine going. But once it's going, then it's like self running, self perpetuating. So even though the amount of signal, the amount of activation coming off of the free integrin is not enough to get GLEE2 turned on, once GLEE2 is on, it's enough to keep it at an elevated level, even though it's lower than it was before. It's enough to keep it up, but it's not enough to turn it on. So this was a surprising result that we didn't expect. And it's consistent with what they think their experience. And so, we're, so we've been trying for a while to set up an actual experiment where we take cells, put them on a hard substrate, activate GLEE2, and then use a pheromone or something to like have them crawl off the substrate and see if the GLEE2 level comes down, but not all the way to zero. We're still working on that. Uh, this is what's called a bifurcation diagram. So it might look a little bit complicated, but I'll just, I'll just explain really quickly. Along the bottom here is KD, right? <clears throat> KD is the ratio of the reverse binding rate to the forward binding rate. So um, larger KD means weaker binding. So this is showing here, this is what I showed before, where with very weak binding, this is GLEE2 level, very weak binding, it won't turn on until you get to a level that will trigger the expression, right? That's when I increase that, um, that, that binding rate constant. So there's some threshold given the parameters that it turns on. But now once it's turned on, if I start to go in the other direction and I start to reduce the binding, right, the KD, it doesn't come back down. It follows a different path on the way down and it never actually goes to zero. It ends up being right here. Uh, so this is called a bifurcation diagram. This is um, called hysteresis when going in one direction. Uh, is different than when you go back in the other direction. And this is a weird hysteresis because you end up at a, a steady state eventually up there. Okay, so this is a, just a very simple example of what we call a dynamical systems analysis. So again, just exploring the behavior of the system. So uh, there's, and then by the way, I've done other things. I've done ex virtual experiments with 1D11 and Gantt 58 and change KDs and concentrations and seen all sorts of interesting stuff that we're also trying to uh, interested in testing in the lab. So from here, you know, what, I've been, what we've been working on, and I'm not gonna go into the details, uh, would be to go to step five, which is comparing to real experimental data. They've got lots of, lots of Western blots and qPCR data. There's lots of variability, et cetera, which makes it challenging, but uh, we're gonna use sophisticated tools to fit the model to that, to, to that data. And then we wanna be able to test predictions like you know, that uh, after we remove the force, GLEE2 levels come down partially, but stay elevated, et cetera. And then uh, once we've done all of that, we can start asking questions like, do we need to add in more biology to answer more sophisticated questions, right? Do we need more molecular species? Do we need to connect to other pathways? This is actually, uh, we, we wrote a grant on this and we're, we're working on 
on a, a new version of it. But as I mentioned, all of the drugs that they've developed based on their understanding of the system haven't worked. So we're, you know, one of the one of the hypotheses is maybe there's crosstalk with other pathways like Wnt, Hedgehog, EGFR, which is why when they block GLE2 or TGF beta, while it works in theory, it doesn't work in practice. Or maybe there's something going on in the tumor microenvironment with other cell types that is preventing the, the, the action of the drug. So these are all things that I currently have students in my lab working on. Okay. So that's it for what is a uh, whirlwind overview of how to build a computational model. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll try to do this little uh, tutorial. Yeah. Software. Yeah. We so we use what's we use Python. Well, we use a package called PySP. Yeah, yeah, and I'm gonna. That's what our the tutorial will be using. Is and I'll show an example of a PySP model. Yeah, but this is by the but I mean th this just this general approach applies to anything. You know, whatever system you're looking at, any type of modeling method that you're using. Yeah, I mean, I think they come mostly on the model, the modeler side, um, but where they come from is, you know, historical uh you know like we read read somebody's paper and they they use this assumption so maybe it will work for us um the it's very hard to give like very specific answers to like a question like that it's just it, it's, it's a lot of it is trial and error right so we'll try an assumption and see if we can explain our data with that assumption right so like i mentioned you know what instead of instead of having a series of steps to build up an oligomer let's just say it all happens in one step. So we're make, just making an assumption it happens really fast. And let's see if that can explain the data. And if that can't explain the data, then we have to go back and question our assumptions. And so we have to try things. Well, you know, we, who knows if it's because we didn't model each step, but maybe it is. So let's try a different model that's got all the steps. And that's where you start to generate these candidate models, right, that I mentioned at the beginning. So you can imagine lifting different assumptions, having simpler versions and more detailed versions, and then using them all to compare against your data and then using some metric to filter out which ones are the best. It's biased towards. We would say that we would fit. I mean, what we want, what we need is the model to reproduce what we know. So, uh, so the first step would be, you know, it, it has to, it has to be able to explain the data that we know, but then we can use the model to ask questions about things that aren't measured. And then we can see, um, and then we can maybe design experiments, right? We can make a prediction that, that if this is true, then if you do this intervention, you should see this happen to this other gene that wasn't measured and you go measure it. And then as you collect that data, it can come back into your model and refine your fitting. And then it becomes more precise the next time and you get even better predictions. That's why I said it keeps iterating like that. Yeah. But I think in general, I think it's true. Once you have a problem to work, I think that the problem is usually not as much as it is. We already make an assumption, and we're already biased in um, Even the stuff that the model is biased to, 
So I think that it's impossible to get away from, from biases. It's more about when there's biases compatible with the current storage environment. Correct. So yeah, yeah. But even, even if you do completely uh, numerical things, when you do machine learning, for example, you buy a thing that has machine learning in the so, so just remember that all models are wrong, but some are useful. You just tell yourself that. That's how you get through the day. Yep. Well, uh, you're saying that I guess depending on which collaborators you want to do some similar risk or development of that risk, that there are certain other tools or mathematical techniques that are associated with the field that if you want to perform here, that is this specific tool that's probably newer or this particular combination of techniques would better answer your question. Do you find that there is this, um, is it easy to absorb something like kind of doing or that has not been accepted or that kind of specific field or that could be okay that you can do whatever works? Uh, that would be on that thing to um, what you would propose as a data or data tool. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, oh, I guess I'll, it, it, it probably will depend on the person, but in general, my experience has been like if we can, if, if we can provide some insight um, that is novel to them or, you know, uh, they're, they're happy. To, for us to use whatever tools to get the job done. Yeah. So because, you know, again, we're, we're trying to, at least this type of modeling, what we're trying to do is, is get insights into actually what's happening inside these systems. So whatever, you know, whatever tools they use to get, to get their data, to get their trends out or whatever, I'm happy to use them. I'm happy to put them into our workflow because at the end of the day, I'm just trying to figure out what protein is binding to what or what cell type is, is, is driving the proliferation of what other cell type or whatever. Any information, any data you can give me to do that is useful. And then if and what I'm hoping to do is just turn around and give them something that they can test experimentally without having to know the details of how I got it. And I think it works well that way. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's do a, a short little hands-on thing, so, okay? So this is a real paper published uh, in 2009 called When Zombies Attack, Mathematical Modeling of an Outbreak of Zombie Infection. So you can find this paper at this site if you want, you wanna search for it, anybody? I'll keep it up there for a second. Yeah. <laughs> None of them are wearing masks. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay. So here's here's the 
here's the basics of it, right? So this is a, a three state model. Uh, I think that calls SIR, Suscept susceptible, um, uh, infected and recovered is the general term for these. But so they have susceptible, which is just like healthy people who can turn into zombies, right? Uh, zombies and then removed, which are just dead people. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so so remember the steps, right? Number one is to write down everything that you know about the system. So here's here's our list of facts. So susceptibles are born uh, with a rate constant pi, and they can become removed or die through natural non-zombie related causes with a rate constant delta. Removed or dead people can uh, become resurrected and become a zombie. And that occurs with a rate constant of zeta, whatever that is. Um, susceptibles can become zombies when they encounter a zombie. Uh, that happens with a rate constant of beta. And zombies can be removed or killed uh, when they are attacked by a susceptible. And that occurs with a rate constant alpha. So your exercise for the next couple minutes is to draw a diagram of based on these facts. So circles with S, Z, and R, and some arrows with some alphas and deltas and whatever over them. <laughs> yeah. Right. And whatever data you've got. Yeah. Right, sure. I've got, you could draw it on board. Anyone want to draw on the board? I've got markers. Hmm? Sure, that would be great. Pepsi is fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, can, I just have a question about the zombies can be removed. So, are you saying that like a zombie can be removed and then they can become another zombie again? It just means it becomes a removed, it, it, it dies. It can become a dead so thing. Oh, 
We could call them dead people, but they just, they called them removed in the paper. So. There's, there's basically, there's three types of people, alive people, dead people, and zombified people, right? And zombies can become dead, and dead people can become zombies, and alive people can become dead and zombies. I never, I, I never actually looked at this carefully until the middle of it. That's a good idea because I'm just thinking about that. That's a good idea. Yeah. By the way, I used the beginning of the first slide. I got a little too big. So now I started to put the model on the I can share this with you because I've brought it works. I kind of work for me. And so I, my first slide now is, you know, how do you model? And so I say, first, you start with a bad model. And so you start by set up, you know, the Ptolemaic, have you written Ptolemaic uh, orbit? You know what I, mean? I think so. Yeah, so, so like the earth is here in the center. Yeah. And if you look at they the go, they yeah, go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, 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 exactly. And you look at the sun, uh, you look at the whole Mars uh, uh, orbit around the earth, you get this like weird thing. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, it's all this stuff, right? Yeah. And this is predicted. You can predict where it's going to be, right. but it's wrong, right? right? Because, you know, you're like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. But if you oh, want yeah, an earth centric yeah. model, you can come up with them. Yeah. And then I segue into, you know, well, you know, uh, you know, the world. And the, and the model world and how yep. they start connected and but the connection between the two is not there's no connection yep. and then i go through the whole uh evolution of uh from you know from from Copernicus all the way to einstein but then i, I talk about one thing that's super important it's a negative result and it's the um the, the what is it, the more experiment the you know what i want the one where they did, they, 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 so up until einstein they thought that ether was what carried yeah. light Nichols. Mikkelsen Morley. Yeah. And the Mikkelsen Morley came and said, Oh, this doesn't exist. And no one talked about Mikkelsen Morley, but if it was not for Mikkelsen Morley, relativity would not develop. Right. Not have developed. Right. So I kind of highlight the importance of important, the importance of starting with a bad model to go to a good model and the importance of negative results. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, but it's essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. so I, I've built on it. Yeah, that's great. I can share those. Yeah, I can share those. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Definitely. Two starting three. Overwhelmed. Um, no, not yet. I have a few things that are out uh, that I'm waiting to hear back on. Um, Gina's paper should come out soon. Yeah, yeah, we're real close, real close on that. Uh, oh, nice. Where? Nice. Yeah. Excellent. I science is a good journal. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really going to have Good. That's awesome. So that got accepted. So Michael paper about revisions at a possible bias of two months. Good. Um, Irvin. And then uh, Oscar. We can talk about Oscar. Oscar's paper. So I so actually I'm going to get to the end. I keep go back to uh yeah, no, I'm not on that one. I'm not on Oscars. No, I, I'd be happy to help, but I'm not on the author. That's what I'm saying. I'd like to. Be. I contributed like to a lot of the initial sort of um, ideas. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the thing with that. So, 
Yeah. Let me, let me finish this with them. Yeah. Then let's talk. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, obviously we're using a tool like Gina's yeah. and Gina's paper. And then no, I mean, it's, it's a good tool. tool. I want my students to do this. But what we need to do is revise it. Okay. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Because I think that we need to, and you know, so if you want to help me that, it's so lovely. So it's so fast and it helps to do it. Friends up. Yeah. Could you help me draw the diagram on the board? Yeah. Yeah. Does yeah. anyone want to draw the diagram on the board? Hey guys, you want to draw a diagram on the board? Six for help, please. To make all the views, which is actually the, the magic. Once you practice down, the magic just you can try different things, you know. But but getting this down is a hard thing. Look at this one. We're having a conversation about the Well, that's very interesting. What we want to do. Oh, not a thing. Oh, not a thing. Oh, not a thing. Oh, not a
Multiply by oh. S and then by by oh. So you have S plus B or S plus B goes to X upon. Okay. So you have the same So, I like your guys's too. If you have the same issue that some of these interactions, right, are, are between two things, like when in a susceptible kills a zombie. So you have Z going to R at the rate alpha, but Z goes to R at alpha depends on how many susceptibles you have. So this is what they do in the paper. They they draw it like this. There are other ways to draw it, whatever. Okay. But there's one one question that I would have. So what do you all think about this? A zombie is killed, and then that killed zombie can come back to life. Yeah. You think that's when you think about that assumption in the model? In The Walking Dead, that doesn't happen. You shoot him in the head. Yeah, but then, no, I'm going to say the head. If you shoot him in the heart, you want to stop him. Then they just get right up. Right, but they're still a zombie. They're not dead at that point. Well, they are for a second. <laughs> Maybe. I'm saying more than not susceptible to. Oh, yeah, right, they keep coming back. So to me, this, I mean, again, all models are wrong. So to me, I would I would have two different types of dead things, right? I have a dead person that is like zombifiable, and then like a dead person with a bullet through their brain, so that that they can't come back. So I'd have two different groups of deads. So we're gonna go uh, with the what's the problem with it? Walking Dead. Walking Dead, yeah. We're going to go to Walking Dead. Uh, sure. Yeah. So we can say that removed, removed by, removed permanently, and then removed. But all exactly. the other, you know, terms that are discussed, like you have to, that's what the Walking Dead can do. Until they, they still can, so if I hit the, 
that's yeah, maybe. Really <laughs> but that's that's an assumption of the model, right? Which immediately stood out to me as like probably not super realistic. Not that a model of a zombie apocalypse is realistic anyway, but if we we're trying to be realistic, right? Then when people, you know, in the movies, when people kill zombies, they cut their head off, the zombies can't come back. But this model, when a person kills a zombie, that zombie can become resurrected and come back. Yeah, but then the zombies are gonna inevitably kill right? But that's that's the point. So this model might be wrong. Right. Or at least if we, we could modify this model and then we could compare what the dynamics are under the different conditions. Why why are they not have this models in the zombie in the model? Or why are they not I'm sorry, why are they not have the zombies in the model? Yeah. I think just because this was their simplest version of the model. But from here you could add more things like that. I just think the pie. Yeah. I think it didn't pie require a S interacting with another S to make Sure. Yeah, that's yeah. another potential that's another feature for the model. Right. Well, so I would say that if you have many more S's than these, then you can consider the pool of S's to be constant, right? Like you have billions of human beings and I don't know, hundreds of zombies or something. And you're assuming that the birth rate is coming out of this big pool. Every person that dies is not really changing the rate of, of birth by very much. So a constant just replenishment of susceptibles would be maybe an acceptable assumption under, but th that's a specific assumption under a specific context. So again, you, we could specifically, we could explicitly add an inner two S's forming a third S or, and then we could compare the dynamics of that model to this one that just has a constant uh, production of S and C under what conditions they give different results. Question. So, um, Yes. No. In the Walking well, Dead. in this model, yeah. Oh, in this model, yes. In the Walking Dead, they do too. No, you know, they didn't. No, you don't. No. Not in the Walking Dead. Return of the Living Dead is radiation. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's infected in the like Walking Dead. The Dawn of the Dead is boredom. <laughs> yes, that's right. Son of the Dead. But yes, the that's, of the dead. That's right. you're totally right. But yes, in in this in this very basic version of this model. If you die of natural causes, you can be resurrected as a zombie. But maybe that shouldn't be the case. Maybe you should only be able to, to be resurrected as a zombie if you're bitten by a zombie. So again, we have to have we may have to have different categories of dead people. Yeah. And this is and this happens right in biology. Like do these proteins interact or whatever, whatever. Are you going to plug the um the Yeah, I mean, so if if any of you want to give this a shot, you can go to this website. And I will pull it. Let me show you here. I'll just go through it in like just two minutes, but. So this is, this is where it, it is. So a repository in GitHub. And if you come down here, it's got um, instructions and you can launch this thing right in your web browser. Pops up over here. It's what's called an IPython notebook or a Jupyter notebook. And in theory, you should be able to run this thing. I think you have to have, you have to have Java script enabled or something. I pulled it down into my, the thing that I run Python code in and so this is what the notebook looks like. And let me just show you all very, very briefly, because there's not much to it. And you know, if you don't have any experience with coding, don't worry about it too much. The, don't worry about the specifics of the code. Remember, this is where people like us who are trained can, can help. But so the way that we build this model, which is pretty simple in this software, is the first thing we have to do is we have to define these parameters, right? The birth rate, the natural death rate, 
the transmission rate, et cetera. All those alpha, delta, beta things, right? We define them, we give them numbers in here. Then we define our different types of players, right? Proteins, cell types, in our case, types of people, susceptible, zombie removed. Then we define initial amounts. How many people do we have? So we're gonna start with 500 susceptible people, no zombies yet, no dead people. And then we define our rules. These are the, the, the interactions, the things basically that you sketched on the board, okay? So birth, susceptibles are born out of thin air in this world, okay? Nothing becomes a susceptible with a birth rate. Uh, susceptibles die. They become removed with some death rate. Susceptibles interact with zombies and you get two zombies at the other end. So the zombies are turning susceptibles into uh, zombifying them. Susceptibles are killing zombies, they get removed, and then dead people come back to life as zombies. That's it. That's how we define it. You know, all this like parentheses and double arrows and stuff, that's just all the coding syntax that you have to learn to do this. So this defines our whole model. Then we say, okay, we're gonna run it over five days. We're gonna output a, a, a thousand times during those five days. We create something called a, a, a SciPy ODE simulator. There's a whole bunch of code for that goes under how this thing works, but we don't care. We just use it. So you just create this thing, you give it the model, you give it your times, your time points, and then you just run. And then this is all just for making plots. And so then when it finishes, you can get something like this. So this is the time course for living people. That's the time course for zombies, days since the outbreak. And the guy who put this together, he put these little sliders together. So we can, I don't know how well it will work. Yeah, we can change the initial number of susceptibles and zombies and whatnot to see. So you can explore what happens as you change those values. Yeah, I mean, this is the very, very basic um, transmission, viral transmission model. Okay, so that's it. Like I said, this is runnable. Uh, in theory, you should be able to run it in your browser if you want it to. And it's just a matter of hitting run and it will go. I'm just curious about that double graded then. Is that special syntax that you special to go? Did they did, did the programmers make that up or is that special OD simulator? You mean uh this thing you mean this thing? Yeah, the double R. Yeah, and I think there's some other operators and operators all have them entirely. So the next two the operators go to the type of that we wanted, and so that's what happens to be on the operator that the higher to them. But this the the double arrow is a Python. It's a Python operator, and it's been over. It's been overridden. It has been overridden. overridden in, yes, ah. yes. So in the PySP language, it it represents the forward uh, direction of a reaction. PySP. That's the software. That's the, the Python package that we use to build these models. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Um, Thank you guys. Oh, I'm